types of responsibility centers. I'm just giving you the information. You use it wherever you have to use it. There are four different types of responsibility centers or three as you feel appropriate. First one is a cost center. A cost center is a center where the there is only cost incurred. There is no source of revenue generated. The um, manager, so when the responsibility comes into picture, the manager is held responsible whether or not he is able to control the cost because there's no source of revenue. So there's no other area or area which is taken into consideration for uh, accountability. Here, the accountability part of it or the responsibility is uh, about whether the manager is able to con control the cost. Um, see, examples of cost centers are anything like a production department, HR department, see, any um, department or division or a function of the uh, organization where they only incur costs. There is no way, there is no source of revenue generated by these centers. Okay. Revenue center, see revenue center where the um, there is only revenue generated but technically uh, many feel that there is no no possibility that there is only revenue generated without incurring any cost but there are also uh, certain examples which are treated as to let's say there is a space available in the organization it is let out um, something like um, generally for atm centers and all the space is let out and everything related to that space is taken care by the bank the operations part of it so there are as such no costs incurred with relation to that particular uh, space see sometimes it is let out to a small um, store or um, uh, some general store or some some corporate cooperative store or something like that so they only take care of all the expenses so it is only about generating revenue some feel that it is not possible that a, a concept like a revenue center can exist. Of course, we do not find a mention in ACCA papers about revenue center, but if at all, if any discussion comes in the case study about a revenue center, you should be aware that some uh, revenue center where there is revenue generated. Now, solely revenue generated is a little difficult, but maybe if it is a possibility, I mean, you should not be surprised. I and mean, each one of them have their own opinion about whether such a center exists or not. The third one is um, profit center, the uh, center where there is cost incurred and also revenue generated. So when there is cost incurred, revenue generated, the difference between revenue and cost um, is profit. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm in a subunit where they uh, also generate revenue apart from taking up the regular other activities of incurring costs. Okay, so such a center is called as profit center. The fourth one is an investment center. Investment centers are basically profit centers only. Profit centers, but the investment made is identifiable with that profit center. So it can be, um, I mean, identified or separately can be seen as to what the amount can be charged or can be identified with the profit center as to what's the investment. So if that identifiability is there, if that uh, relative investment, what goes into that particular center, if it is known, then such profit centers are called as investment centers. Now, evaluation wise, if we talk about the cost center manager is evaluated based on whether the costs were controlled. At this point of time, we have to understand that there are two different types of costs based on controllability. See, one aspect, one category or one division of, um, oh, sorry, one um, type of cost based on controllability, we see that there are controllable costs and uncontrollable costs. There are two different types of costs. How do we um, understand what's the meaning of control controllable cost? See, because of a decision taken by the manager, if the costs are controllable, if they can be controlled by the decision of the manager, we call them as controllable cost. Basically, all variable costs are controllable costs because if because of the decision taken, if the activity is reduced, the costs are also reduced. So all variable costs are controllable in nature. Some of the uh, 
uh, fixed costs are also controllable in nature. We'll discuss that in a short time. So here broadly, when we talk about what are controllable costs, because of the decision taken by the manager, if the costs are controlled, we call them as controllable costs. There are certain costs which are not controllable. Con not controllable because, because of the nature of costs. See, the manager is head of only a particular center. He is not under control of many other activities, many other departments, uh, many other hierarchy levels in the organization. His purview is limited only to his department. So now as part of that particular department or a responsibility center, there are costs incurred by the responsibility center. There are costs which are assigned to the responsibility center. Some of the costs are charged to the responsibility centers. Like, say, suppose if they have to share a portion of the uh, factory rent or uh, let's say these top management's salaries or some establishment charges. Okay, these are costs which are charged to the department. Can he have uh, a say in whether he wants to take it up or not? No, absolutely he is not uh, in, I mean, it is not under his purview that he can um, eliminate those costs or he can control those costs. There are certain other costs which are um, a commitment made in the past, like maybe they have entered into a lease agreement, lease charges are there. So lease expenses, a portion of it has been charged to the department. So uh, lease charges or uh, depreciation that is charged on the uh, assets, these are called as committed costs. They are absolutely uncontrollable for the manager of a responsibility center. Okay, so if these costs are not controllable, they are called as uncontrollable costs. Controllable costs and uncontrollable costs. Are uncontrollable costs absolutely uncontrollable at every, every level? No, sometimes some of the uncontrollable costs may become controllable costs if, they, if the decision is taken by another level manager. So somebody superior to this manager, so in that hierarchy, um, his boss or his superior he may have a uh, authority to take major decisions like maybe uh, the asset can be sold away so that there is no more depreciation charge. The manager can take a decision about how much uh, amount of fixed cost should be charged to this particular division. So some of the costs may become controllable by another level manager. So all uncontrollable costs are not absolutely uncontrollable. They may become controllable um, for someone who is superior to this manager. Okay. So here at this point of time, if we are talking about evaluation, so if the manager is held accountable, he is held responsible for the type of cost that is incurred. So his, his control, uh, his um, evaluation should be subject to whether he was able to control the cost or not. Okay. Controllability. Controllability is uh, the factor whether the costs are controllable or not and the evaluation should go according to that. Revenue center, whether the manager is, has taken any measures to generate more amount of revenue. So that is, that is the evaluation purview. Profit center is a center where the... <clears throat> Manager is held responsible for controlling the cost, generating more revenue, and thereby uh, realizing more amount of profit, generating more profit. So that is the uh, that is what the manager of a profit center will be held responsible for. Now there is a profit center. The evaluation. Evaluation happens in a contribution reporting manner. You can make a note of that also. What is contribution reporting format? See, contribution reporting or marginal analysis, you know that sales minus variable cost is contribution, contribution minus fixed cost is profit. So sales minus or the revenue minus all variable cost deducted are contribution. So otherwise in simple situations we have Sales minus variable cost is contribution minus fixed cost.
But here, fixed cost, as we have discussed just now, some of the fixed costs are controllable, some of the fixed costs are uncontrollable. Okay. So sometimes the fixed cost is controllable at the department level also. Sometimes the decisions that are taken, uh, some of the fixed costs can also be controlled at the division level. Let's say that they have decided, uh, if the manager has decided that um, henceforth they would not require two supervisors, but only one supervisor is needed to um, supervise the work that is carried on in the department. Now, in that case, supervisor salary, basically the nature of the cost is, is fixed in nature. So that, that portion of one supervisor salary, though being a fixed cost, now will be eliminated. So if, if there is any portion of fixed cost which, is, uh, which can be controlled, we call that as controllable fixed cost, then the rest of it is uncontrollable fixed cost. Controllable fixed cost and uncontrollable fixed cost. So the report now here would be split as the fixed cost should be split into one portion is controllable fixed cost, one portion is uncontrollable fixed cost. So it is it would be appropriate if the manager of a profit center is evaluated based on the controllable margin, controllable profit. Because all this is under his purview. See, the variable cost and the controllable fixed cost are within his purview. Uncontrollable fixed costs are like uh, some amount of um, allocated fixed costs or uh, um, any committed costs that were uh, committed in the past and therefore they are incurred now. So these are all part of uncontrollable fixed costs. So it is an opinion that the manager should not should be held responsible only for whether he was able to maximize the controllable margin. He should not be evaluated based on uncontrollable fixed expenses. But then there is again another um, opinion which says that, um, see, ultimately all the costs that are incurred by the organization have to be borne by the departments because now the organization is depart divided into departments or responsibility centers. So ultimately all costs should be absorbed by these things. So maybe initially, in the initial years, the manager can be um, exempted from um, making him accountable for the uncontrollable fixed cost. But eventually, the manager also has to uh, take up the responsibility of bearing this uncontrollable fixed cost also. Okay. In that sense, he, would, he should be putting an effort to maximize the revenue. But the revenue, more amount of sales revenue is generated that will be able to absorb the uncontrollable fixed cost and he, the manager should be evaluated based on the net operating profit uh, that is generated. So maybe in the initial years, it, little exemption can be shown, but eventually the manager should be able to generate more amount of revenue to absorb the uncontrollable fixed cost and the evaluation should be based on what is the net operating profit. Okay, That's how the um, the <coughs> profit center manager is, manages performance is evaluated. Then we see the fourth category. Fourth category is the fourth type is um, investment center. So the tools that are used for investment center are uh, ROI and RA. So I'll explain to you what are ROI and RA. The fourth type of responsibility center is investment center or um, a profit center with, uh, with which we can uh, identify the investment amount. Therefore, the tools that are used, um, see, the manager would be held because there are costs incurred, revenue generated, profit is generated. Next, it, the investment amount is also known. So, the manager's uh, responsibility areas would be about cutting down on the cost, generating more revenue, generating maximum profit. And this profit is evaluated in relation to the amount of investment that is made. So, the tools that are used to evaluate the performance is ROI or R and, sorry, ROI and RI. 
ROI is return on investment. Return on investment, we will learn about that. Return on investment and the second one is residual income. Let's learn about these things. Um, how the performance is evaluated using uh, ROI and RI. Sorry, ma'am. ROI and RI. I, I said only that. What happened? My voice is breaking. No, yeah, yes, it was breaking, ma'am. Last line or from the beginning? The last, last line. Okay. I just said ROI and RI. No, I was just okay. switching the PPT. This is um, ACCA PM PPT. Okay. So, how is the division performance measurement um, taken up? See, ACC is always silent about the concept of a revenue center. So, let's go with this only. Um, that's only for information's sake I have mentioned that. But anytime, anywhere, anything which comes up related to revenue center, you have the uh, information about that. There are three different types of um, responsibility centers, a cost center, profit center, and investment center. Investment center. Now, how is the performance of an investment center measured? Investment center is measured um, based on what is the amount of profit that is generated. Profit generated, then again, we would be looking into whether costs were controlled, more revenue was generated, profit was maximized. And this profit in relation to the amount that is invested. So if investment made is 100%, if this is 100% return or what we call it as profit, profit is what percentage? So the equation goes as profit upon investment into 100. So at this point of time, we should understand that there are other terms also interchangeably used. ROI is return on investment. The terms are also called as ROCE return on capital employed, see, or another term which is interchangeably used is ROA, return on assets. See, the amount of investment which is raised in an organization is by raising the capital. So, the total amount of capital that is raised from all sources, that is debt capital and equity capital, that is capital raised and employed in the business. So, investment could also mean capital employed, where is that invested? That is invested into assets. Therefore, these three terms are interchangeably used. Of course, technically, when we look into that, how, when we calculate the formula, um, the way the variables, the values that are taken may slightly change. So the answers according to what is ROI, ROC, ROA may differ. But here, at this, in this particular context, at this point of time, we just understand that whether they are talking about ROI or ROCE or ROA, ultimately all of them basically mean to say that what is the amount of profit that is generated as against the amount of investment made, ROI or ROCE or ROA. Okay. Controllable profit before interest and tax. That is nothing but EBIT. Okay. Controllable profit before interest and tax divided by controllable capital employed. Advantages of ROI is it's it's converted into percentage, so it is easy to understand. See, if we are to talk about in absolute values, so let's say that the investment is 20 crores, the profit amount is, um, let's say, um, it says 50 lakhs or something. We don't know whether it is a decent amount because the figures are so big and then we don't understand in absolute sense or absolute terms whether the profit that is generated is good or bad. But once that is converted into percentage, I think relatively it becomes much easier to understand that. So that is the advantage. Relative measures therefore aids comparison between different. So once it is converted into percentages, I think it is easy for uh, taking up comparative analysis also. Used externally, ROC and therefore understood by users, encourages good use of existing capital resources. See, if for the amount of capital that is invested, was it useful or not? And to what extent was it useful? Then that can be understood by the percentage that is calculated. 
it can be broken down into secondary ratios for more detailed analysis. So, little later we will discuss about what are the other broken down into secondary ratios. For the moment, let's proceed further. Disadvantages are ROI increases and assets uh, as asset gets older. If uh, I'll just explain to you. We talk about ROI as the formula is In the numerator, there is profit. In the denominator, we see that either it is investment amount or we, we see there is capital employed or interchangeably, it is also about assets. As the time passes by, the assets, the assets value decreases. We know that because of wear and tear, etc. It comes to a point where sometimes because of wear and tear or sometimes because of obsolescence, whatever it is, assets have to be replaced. So once the assets replace, are replaced, the cost increases. Just because there is an asset replaced drastically, nothing will happen in terms of what is the profit that is generated. Profit consistently would be more or less the same. But the denominator where the investment amount increases because of assets to be replaced because of wear and tear, because of obsolescence, because of um, the expiry of the lifetime or for these reasons, when the asset has to be replaced, so we see that the ROI, calculated ROI, denominator increases, the ratio decreases. Because the managers are evaluated based on ROI for an investment center. The managers are evaluated based on ROI and RI. I, I will also explain that today. So uh, now ROI, what is the percentage? See, the reasons will not be looked into um, for evaluation at the time of evaluation, but the evaluation would go on what is the calculated value of ROI and RI. So if the ROI has decreased, See, what are the reasons so much intricately it would not be looked into. Therefore, the managers fear that they would be evaluated badly. They may not be willing to replace assets which have uh, become obsolete or the, which are not very effective. Efficiency is not seen in these, those assets. They still manage to continue with that. That can have an impact on the organization. If the assets are replaced, the investment cost increases. If the investment cost increases, the denominator increases, the ratio decreases. So ROI would be lesser. So it will decrease. So if it is decreasing, if it is dec if it decreases, it would have an impact on their performance. Therefore, the managers do not want to replace the assets. That's one disadvantage. Second one, it says that may lead to dysfunctional decisions. See, um, whenever we talk about performance management, there is one aspect of dysfunctional behavior of the managers which comes into picture. See, sometimes now there is a conflict here about what is um, what is beneficial to the organization, what is beneficial to the manager. So the managers, when they are taking decisions, they may. Uh, focus on their personal benefit rather than the benefit of the organization. Now, that is dysfunctional in nature. It, sometimes it, it, it should be looked at what is the benefit of the organization. Just because in one period they would be evaluated for a lesser ROI, they should not take decisions about not replacing the assets. If the assets are not replaced, it definitely has an impact on the efficiency. But since they are looking at their personal evaluation and benefit, not looking at the benefit of the organization, they may be involved in they may be involved in presenting the accounting information in this manner or not taking decisions which can benefit the organization in the long run. Okay, so that um, is one uh, one risk that is present, one issue that has to be looked into. Here it says that. Um, they may this may lead to dysfunctional decision in terms of a comparative decision. Let's say that here there is an example given. 
a current ROF 30 percent. Let's say that an organization uh, in the organization a division is um, making a or has an ROI recorded ROI of 30 percent. Then there is a danger that is present not to accept any project which has an ROI less than 30 percent. So that is a danger there. The criteria once there is a standard set or once there is a ROI that is generated which is quite high or good or uh, anything then the decisions of the manager could become biased biased towards not accepting any project which has a an ROI lesser than the current ROI. The decision criteria should not be about what is the current ROI and take a decision in relation to current ROI but rather ROI should be greater than cost of capital. If, if it is if it is greater than cost of capital, I think any ROI greater than cost of capital should be taken up. Okay, so that that is one thing um, so which, which can be looked at as a disadvantage because the there is a bias of the manager that anything which is less than the current ROI should not be accepted. It could be it, it would be very wrong to always look at uh, projects uh, having higher ROI being as beneficial to the organization. See, let's say, for example, maybe their cost of capital is 15%. So any project which gives an ROI greater than 15% is their benefit. It is giving them a possibility to uh, generate more amount of profit. So anything in addition, the present one anyway would be there. But in addition to that, any other project which, which has ROI greater than their cost of capital should be accepted but should not be rejected. That's another disadvantage because it's already a standard set. Therefore, they want to always achieve that standard. It may not be always possible to uh, touch that standard. So the criteria should be in terms of a comparison with what is cost of capital and take a decision whether the project should be accepted or not not based on what is the current ROI. Then, see, because ROI helps us to um, take up a comparative analysis, here it would not be appropriate to uh, compare uh, across different, different departments or divisions uh, or business entities because each one of them may be following a different accounting policy. A basic example, suppose unit 1 is following straight line method of depreciation, unit 2 is following diminishing value depreciation. The unit 1 would have consistently the same amount of depreciation charged to the income statement year after year. But a division which is charging written down value method in the initial years, the amount of depreciation is quite high and it gradually decreases as the time passes by. So they are not charging the same amount of depreciation. That's just one example. Likewise, many other things where there are alternative methods available, then because they follow different accounting methods, there would be an impact on the profit that is generated. Therefore, it would not be appropriate to evaluate them based on ROI um, across different departments or units of business entities. Okay, That's another disadvantage. Is it clear, my voice? Suddenly, some issue has come. Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. Okay. Uh, another uh, tool that is used or another variable that is used to measure the performance of investment center is called as residual income. Residual is something which is left over. That is the remaining balance. That is the term of residual, residual income. So what is residual income? So residual income, here it says that Pre-tax controllable profit minus imputed charge for controllable investment investor capital. It's such a complicated, it sounds like that in simple terms. We just see that there is EBIT. Now EBIT from EBIT. Um, 
one second let me put an income statement format of it. one second So when we see that this is an income statement format, EBIT is this one. So EBIT will take care of the other expenses. So one after EBIT, we see that there is interest amount paid. Then we see taxes paid. After that, we see preferred dividend and then ordinary dividend. So these are all returns that are paid to the investors on different types of capital. Profit should be sufficient enough that they would be that would be able to meet the cost of capital. So the concept of it is see, do they have sufficient amount of profits to meet the cost of capital, residual income? So even after meeting the cost of capital, there are three different types of uh, categories here. We see interest amount, we see preferred dividend, we see equity dividend. These things also have to be met out of the amount of EBIT, the EBIT that is generated. So the formula goes like this. RI is equal to EBIT minus, minus, we see that work, weighted average cost of capital. You see, on an average, what is the cost of capital? Considering all, all three, technically there are four, all four of them. The fourth one is retained earnings. Retained earnings is basically the investment amount of ordinary shareholders. Therefore, there are three different types of uh, costs of capital. That is, we see that interest paid on debt capital, preferred dividend paid on preferred capital, equity paid on uh, equity dividend paid on equity capital, equity or ordinary equity um, capital. The same thing is paid on retained earnings, which are reinvested. Okay. So, weighted average cost of capital calculated on the operating, average operating assets of the business or investment or assets. So the percentage of weighted average cost of capital calculated on the total amount of investment that is made into assets, okay, operating assets. This portion of cost of capital is deducted from EVIT. After deducting the cost of capital from EBIT, whatever is remaining is residual income. Whatever is the balance of uh, profit still available. What would they do with that? After meeting cost of capital, what would they do with this uh, residual income? It is used for reinvestment. It is used for contingency. Was I not showing you the income statement format till now? No, you had showed me. You have showed me. Okay. No, when, when we change the slide, so whatever is scribbled on the screen, it will go. It didn't go initially, so I was little tested about that. Okay. So what is done with residual income? See, after meeting the cost of capital, the imputed charge for controllable invested capital. So that term sounds quite imputed charges are a cost of capital. Technically, on the capital, <clears throat> there is, I mean, the term imputed cost is something which is a notional cost. Technically, it doesn't exist because owner has invested the amount. Therefore, uh, would he take would he collect interest on his capital in reality that is from a sole proprietor's point of view um, it doesn't appear but then that is a business expense which is uh, allowed to be shown in the books of account so it is shown therefore we call it as a notional cost or imputed cost so when we talk about cost of capital cost of capital is also referred to as imputed cost or imputed charges on controllable invested capital okay that is about RI. RI is from the controllable profit, which is EBIT. EBIT minus um, EBIT minus 
the weighted average cost of capital calculated on the invested amount, invested capital. The advantages of RI. See RI, if RI happens to be a negative figure, which which indicates that um, there is not sufficient amount of profit available to meet the cost of capital, it can be very easily understood from that. It says that reduces the problems of rejecting projects with ROI greater than that, but then uh, it's it's not mentioned here. But the accept reject rule is uh, the accept reject rule is if the um, project has a positive RI, it would be accepted. If it is a negative RI, it is not. Uh, accepted so it's easy to understand whether it is doing good or not it's very easy to understand see there is one disadvantage just now we studied about roi which says that if the roi of uh, if the current roi is at a percentage there is a danger that any uh, any project with an roi less than the current roi would be rejected so that thing would not arise here. See, reduces the problem of rejecting projects with ROIs greater than group target, but less than here the decision criteria is whether ROI is positive or negative. That's it as simple as that. See, the, um, the concept of rejecting projects which are very good but they do not meet the current standard that which we studied as a disadvantage of ROI, now here it doesn't appear. So here it is about whether R, RI is positive or not, as simple as that. Okay. Then possible to use different rates of interest for different types of businesses. See, the cost of capital, weighted average cost of capital, can be uh, different for different businesses. So we call that as risk adjusted um, cost of capital. If the risk in the business is very high, the discount rates that are used or the interest rates or the cost of capital rates that are used also would be high because they have to uh, <clears throat> discount their future cash flows at a higher discount rate because of the amount of risk that is present. So if the cost of capital rates are different for different businesses, comparison again is not appropriate. Now cost of financing a division is brought home, brought home to digital managers. The, um, the responsibility that they should be able to um, meet the cost of capital. It is just not some amount of revenue generated or profit generated, but earn profits in such a manner that the profit that is generated is taken care, it takes care of the cost of capital also, because from the profit available, cost of capital is deducted. It also takes care of the cost of capital. Okay. Cost of financing a division is brought home to divisional managers. Now, the divisional managers also now start taking up the responsibility of meeting the cost of capital. Disadvantages of RI does not facilitate comparisons between divisions of different sizes. Okay, so in case of ROI, because everything is made into a common percentage. Comparison becomes easy here. It becomes very difficult. It's absolute figures. So bigger size uh, investment will have a, a higher RI value. Smaller investments will have smaller I, RI values. The comparison becomes difficult in case of RI. Okay. That's the concept of ROI and RI. So today, right now, we will look into a question. From the PM exam kit, I think today you have only two classes, no? Is 
this is the question here on the screen lens company now this is about calculate the return on investment for each division for the year ended 30 december and uh, calculation basis of the calculation make makes it a suitable measure for assessing the digital manager's performance b bit says that calculate roi c bit says that um, discuss whether uh, it is appropriate to treat each each of the divisions of a lens company as investment centers so uh, fourth one says what are the problems involved in using roi to measure the performance so let's take it up let's read through this particular question and uh, uh, answer what are the requirements 313 question uh, from uh, maybe this is an old old version i'm using the number may different but the question is the same lens company lens company december uh, 2016 this was tested in the exam lens company manufactures lenses for use by a wide range of commercial customers the company has two divisions the photographic division p and the optometry division o each of the divisions is run by a division manager who has overall responsibility for all aspects of running their division and the divisions are currently treated as investment centers each manager however has an author authorization limit of 15000 per item for capital expenditure and any other items costing more than this must first be approved by head of then we see that during the year head of is made a decision to sell a large amount of the equipment in division b and replace it with more technologically advanced equipment it also decided to close one of division o's factories in a country deemed to be politically unstable with the intention of opening a new factory elsewhere in the following year both divisions trade with overseas customers choosing to provide their these customers with 60 days credit to encourage sales due to differences in exchange rates between the time of invoicing the customers and receiving the payment 60 days later exchange gains and lo losses often occur the cost of capital for lens company is 12% per annum the following data relates to the year ended 30 november 2006 we see that um, we have the income statements the following data relates to the year ended 30 november revenue gain on sale of equipment these are direct costs then we have profits and then other types and then net uh, divisional profit is given to us for both divisions p and q apart from that there are certain other details also provided we have vision p and q's depreciation amount is given depreciation on uncontrollable assets included in divisional overheads non current assets controlled by the division non current assets controlled by head office we have inventories and other uh, current assets and current liabilities to date managers have always been paid a bonus based on roi achieved by their division however the company is considering whether residual income would be a better method okay calculate the roi for each division um, ensuring that the basis of the calculation makes it a suitable measure for assessing the division manager's performance so calculation of roi is what we have to take up then evaluate in detail about what is roi etc so we will be looking into that we'll paste this one in an excel sheet and then take it take up answering this particular question
the first requirement is we have to calculate roi for each division formula for roi is in the there is a it's a fraction the numerator has controllable profit denominator has controllable investment so this is the formula controllable profit before interest and tax divided by controllable capital employed so let's take it I'll write it here maybe i can because the data is no data is about i'll just write it here roi what is controllable profit before interest and taxes now let's look into what is controllable profit before interest and taxes revenue is there from revenue gain on sale of equipment um, what is the um, that source of uh, revenue that is um, some profit that is generated um, basically that is non operating in nature gain any kind of a gain that is generated um so as it was sold and then some amount of uh, um gain that is uh, generated For division P, there is a gain of four hundred. For division O, there is no um, neither there is gain nor loss. This is the nature of gain is non-operating because they are into um, buying and selling of goods, not buying and selling of assets. Okay, so therefore, when the income statements. are prepared for evaluation of the performance generally um, non operating nature transactions are not taken into consideration um let's start straight away with the revenue generated and the controllable cost because contribution margin format is what we have understood for the evaluation purpose the contribution margin format of differentiating between what are controllable cost and uncontrollable cost so based on that um, we will be looking into that okay so let's start division p and division q so first start with revenue
divisional overheads has a note depreciation on uncontrollable assets included in divisional overhead so we will have to exclude the because depreciation is a committed cost it is uncontrollable the manager cannot do anything about eliminating the depreciation amount it will be incurred therefore it is uncontrollable in nature so that depreciation was also included in divisional overhead just let's write these two figures after that we can So, divisional overheads we have here um, 3800 from 3800 depreciation of 320 should not be included so deduct that so it is only 3480 next Five thousand two hundred minus four hundred and sixty. So these are controllable expenses. So we have trading profit, then other items like exchange gain or loss, exceptional cost for factory closure, allocated fixed office cost. Until this point of time, whatever is the um the profit that is um, this trading profit and we have these things as controllable cost so this is controllable profit after controllable profit see we see that uh, um, ex exchange gain or loss with, uh, for division p it is 200 and division o it is 460 exceptional cost for factory closure these are unavoidable when at the time closure of the business 1800 that is incurred by o is unavoidable in nature not under the control uh, of the manager then we see allocated head office cost so there are three different things that are given one is exchange gain or loss because of exchange of assets then some amount of um, gain or loss that has happened second one is exceptional cost for factory closure at the time of closing down on something they had incurred a cost of 1800 and then allocated fixed cost the we now have to decide on what is uh, what are the costs that are under the control, under the purview of the manager. So we see all direct costs, all variable costs are basically controllable costs. So there is no issue there. And divisional overheads, the overheads that are incurred, out of which one amount of depreciation that is there, which anyway is not controllable. So eliminate that. We took the other things. Then when we run through these three different types of costs, there was a decision to exchange something. On account of that, In for one department there is a loss, another department there was a gain. So the decision was taken by the manager. On that note, this one also falls under the category of what are uh, controllable costs. Then when the... Um, when the division is shut down, closure, factory closure, 1800 is 
uncontrollable, unavoidable cost. They cannot see at the time of shutdown of the business, there are certain costs that would be incurred. See, not, nobody can do anything about avoiding those costs. They would be incurred, they are basically uncontrollable in nature. So also allocated costs are uncontrollable. See, the manager cannot refuse to accept these costs. He will have to take it up and absorb them in the total costs that are um, against the profit that uh, against the revenue that is generated. Out of these three, we see this was a decision of the manager. Therefore, we will also deduct exchange gain or loss. So, for the first department, it is uh, minus 200. For the other one, it is a positive thing, which is positive. This becomes controllable profit. After that, now we need to uh, calculate what is we also have the details about the assets and liabilities. Non-current non assets controlled by the division. Non-current assets controlled by the head office. Inventories. Trade receivables. Overdraft. Trade payable. See, with relation to operating assets and liabilities, in relation to the current assets and current liabilities, current assets and current liabilities are uh, taken up or the investment is taken up to ensure that the operating activity is taken up. The main activity is to buy and sell. As part of buying the raw material, they would have inventory which is used, uh, unused, semi-used, whatever it is. Inventory is one thing. See, when, they when they take a decision of selling that, buying and selling, so, on account of sales, um, receivables may arise. See, because the material was purchased on credit basis, payables arise. See, these are all assets which are under the control of the manager, the divisional manager. So, we see that there are assets which are under the control of the manager. See, with respect to fixed assets, it was a clear markation that is given that some of the fixed assets, non-current assets are fixed assets. Some of the uh, fixed assets are controlled by the division only. Some of them are controlled by the head office. So head office, he cannot have a say on that. So they become uncontrollable in nature. Um, the rest of them are controllable. So let's write. I am writing it here, but then I'll drag it up because the remaining solution is there. So as of now, I'm I'm writing it here. What are controllable assets? Um, under that, let's write non-current assets controlled by the division. Fifteen thousand four hundred, and we have it here as twenty thousand seven hundred. After that, um, the, the rest of them are current assets and current liabilities. So, inventories.
1,800, 3,900, trade receivables, 1200 8900 then the other two are overdraft and uh, trade uh, payables so these are controllable assets minus controllable liabilities or rather we can write the controllable liabilities in a negative uh, figure and then add them up so overdraft these are current liabilities overdraft is one thing trade payables so overdraft is we'll write it as minus signs minus 500 and for the other one it is nil next year it is minus 5100 and here it is minus 7200 I'll just take it up. Okay. So this is controllable assets. Now calculate what is ROI. ROI is equal to If this is done, we'll I'll scroll down to see what is the, the next requirement. If you have made a note of yes, it. Yeah. A bit says calculate the return on investment for each division for the year ended 30 November. It's uh, ensuring that the base of calculation makes it a suitable measure for assessing the divisional manager's performance. Only calculation, six months. After that, explain why you have included or excluded certain items in calculating the ROIs in Part A, stating any assumptions you have made. So as, as we were discussing also, I did um, mention, see, there are some of the items which we have not included at all. See, from the income statement, gain on sale of equipment is the nature of uh, item is, it is non-operating in nature. So non-operating expenses would not be taken. We, we are basically talking about the controllable activities, controllable investments, controllable profits that are generated. Anything to do with assets is part of a commitment made earlier in the past by uh, other level managers. See, the, as, uh, the acquisition of assets or disposal of assets is not under the purview of the division manager. So anything to do with gain and sale of that here uh, as part of that uh, would not be <clears throat> under the purview of the divisional manager. So gain on sale of equipment, it is not his decision. Um, on that note, um, this was omitted. It is non-operating in nature, basically. Gain on uh, sale of equipment is non-operating in nature. It is a 
committed expenses made in the uh, past the decision was taken in the past by the superior or the senior level managers and uh, if the asset was sold it was because of their decision therefore it does not fall under the purview of controllable items therefore we have omitted that one okay then if if we talk about on that note the amount of depreciation in connection to the equipment or the assets also was omitted because it is a committed fixed cost it is not a controllable fixed cost therefore we have omitted that one uh, that one also Exceptional cost for factory closure we have omitted because uh, the decisions of factory closure is uncontrollable uh, for this level manager. It is a decision taken by another level manager. Allocated head office costs also are uncontrollable in nature because they are just allocated to the division. It uh, how much of these costs would be incurred or allocated allocation basis also will be decided by the senior level managers. What portion of the cost should be charged to that? See, there are various ways, various assumptions based on which these costs are incurred. So it is not under the control of the division manager. Therefore, we have excluded that. Okay. Exchange gain or loss. See, all direct costs are controllable in nature. Therefore, we have included. Divisional overheads other than uncontrollable costs are included. Exchange gain or loss is included because uh, uh, it was based on the decision taken by the manager about exchange gain or loss. Um, this exchange gain or loss was an account of um, sales. Um, there is a mention here given. During the year, head office made a decision to sell a large amount of equipment. Uh, head office made, therefore, it is not under the purview. Uh, it is also decided to close one of the O's factory in a country deemed to be politically unstable with the intention of opening a new factory elsewhere in the following year. Such decisions are taken by the strategic level management. Therefore, it, it is uncontrollable. Then uh, exchange part of it is both divisions trade with overseas customers. Choosing the choosing to provide these customers with 60 days credit to encourage sales um, due to difference in exchange rates between the time of invoicing the customers and this. So this was related to uh, sales um, made abroad. So any um, any uh, gain or loss because of fluctuations in the exchange rates was that exchange. Okay, so that happened because of sale which is an operating transaction therefore we have included see the content wise when we look at that it's so simple and eight marks it seems simple if you know the concept if we do not know the concept why is anything included why is something not included is absolutely beyond our reach the logic here should be about what is operating in nature include what is non-operating in nature do not include what is controllable under uh, for the manager include what is not controllable for the manager exclude it's only simple theory that has to be typed we don't have a lot of explanation which goes into that but the clarity if it is there easy if it is not there at every mistake you make you will lose marks there okay so be alert about the questions about that. see if it says this Briefly discuss whether it is appropriate to treat each of the division of lens company as investment centers. What's the criteria to treat anything as an investment center? What is an investment center if we talk about? What is an investment center? An investment center is basically a profit center only. So something which is generating uh, revenue. But along with that, Along, along with that, the amount of investment that is made is identifiable. Okay, so therefore we call, uh, I mean, therefore such centers are called as investment centers because investment is identified, identified with the 
um, center. So how do we basically uh, decide on that? There are two divisions. Each of the division is run by a divisional manager who has overall responsibility for all aspects of running their divisions and the divisions are currently treated as investment centers. And the question defines that these are investment centers, but now we have to justify uh, whether they can be called as an investment center or not. Other details are, each manager, however, has an authorization limit of 15,000 per item for capital expenditure and any item costing more than this must be approved by head office. So investment, only one portion of the investment is under the uh, control of the manager. The rest of it has to be um, taken approval from the head office. During the year, head office made a decision to sell a large amount of equipment in Division P and replace it with more technologically advanced equipment. It also decided to close one of Division O's factories in a country deemed to be politically unstable with the intention of opening a new factory elsewhere in the following year. Both divisions trade with overseas customers, choosing to provide these customers with 60 days credit and something about that. The cost of capital for Lens company is 12% per annum. The following data relates to the year ended 30 November 2006. This is the data that is given. To date, managers have always been paid a bonus based on the return on investment achieved by their division. However, the company is considering whether residual income would be a better method. So, the question uh, is asking us to justify uh, whether they should be called as investment centers or not. We will discuss whether it is appropriate to treat each of the divisions of Lens Company as investment centers. simple concept only a very small point of it um, simple concept um, let me scroll it up so you decide whether it is a response investment center or not this is one small point which you have to identify and talk about it There is only one yes or no. <laughs> Both are correct. There is no such, such thing as right or wrong. So I have put that main point here. See, they, the, see, this is an investment center. Investment identified with that. But relating to investment, does the authority lies with the manager? So they can, they have the authorization limit on only up till 15,000. So it is under... Uh, the purview of the manager only till the extent of 15,000. Beyond that, they have to again approach the head office. So, because investment, at least a portion of investment um, is under their control, we can uh, rightly treat them as investment centers because uh, see, the entire operating activity is under the purview of the manager. So, profit generated is basically controllable profit which is under his purview. That is fine. Investment also, a major part of the investment is under the purview of the uh, managers. We see that uh, controllable, controllable non-current assets by the division, controllable non-current assets by the head office, only a small portion we see that. Because the limit is set the non-current assets uh, limit is set for the um, working capital, but for the non-current assets also, a small portion of the investment in non-current assets is under the control of the head office. 
a major portion of it is under the purview of the division managers only. So therefore, we can call them as investments. And but I think uh, the control of this portion also, if it can be given to the managers, it can be truly called as an investment center. That's it. That's a simple concept for you to talk. That's only two marks. After that, another four marks. Discuss the problems involved in using ROI to measure the manager's performance. See, it is not lens um, performance. Very, uh, it is in the question is asked in a generic sense only. So, very generic sense. If it is asked, so you can basically talk about all the disadvantages of ROI. So, what are the disadvantages of ROI? If we are looking, if we look into that. Um, and ROI, um, see, this can result in um, decisions of not replacing the assets, even if the assets become obsolete, um, if the assets have to be replaced because of wear and tear, etc. Also, that would result in uh, having an impact on ROI. ROI would uh, reduce if the investment amount increases. Therefore, they continue with the, those inefficient assets and have an impact on the efficiency of the organization. That's one disadvantage. Second disadvantage is the managers may reject any project which has a lesser ROI than the standard ROI or the current ROI. That can have an impact on not able to maximize their profitability because any project with a ROI greater than the cost of capital should be or can be accepted. Therefore, on that note, that becomes a disadvantage. For comparative purposes, it is not a useful, it is not very useful because of the different accounting policies followed by different divisions. So, because the question is very, very generic, it is not um, very specifically asked about uh, in lens uh, company, what are the disadvantages? It's, it's just general. Discuss the problems involved in using ROI to measure the manager's purpose. So then talk about that and it's four months. I hope the question is clear. The solution. Is it clear? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Let's take a break. Three hours class. No? Let's take a break and then join back in 10 minutes. Okay. 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 Yes, ma'am. 